we've seen uh, a central role played by a group of low-paid service workers in the uh, in both the public and private sectors, the crucial role of cleaners, uh, security guards, uh, the uh, role of uh, uh, various delivery services in keeping food flowing during the, during the lockdown phase of the pandemic. Uh, all of these are, are the kinds of jobs that usually go unnoticed when, when we see glossy ads about all the jobs that are being created by governments. Uh, these aren't the kind of jobs that are mentioned. Uh, looking, uh, these are all the ones I've mentioned are, are, are relatively low paid jobs, but also uh, the work of professionals has become uh, increasingly important, particularly in the public sector and, and uh, health professionals, doctors and nurses, obviously central to things, but also uh, people who had to homeschool their children uh, brought very much face to face with the incredibly hard work that teachers do, the crucial role of, of teaching in schools in our society. So uh, this is this has been brought home by the pandemic, by the particular circumstance of the pandemic, obviously, which bear directly on everything that brings people into contact with each other. Uh, but it, it also reflects trends that have been going on in the labour force for a very long time, but which haven't really percolated into our into our political thinking. I should say, uh, in addition to those, of course, uh, all those conditions also apply uh, to areas like cafes, restaurants and so forth. Uh, the crucial thing with the pandemic is personal delivery services are the things that have been hit uh, hit most most directly. So um, when we look at, uh, as Rebecca said, when we look at the um, at the response of governments, though, it's all about creating what are called hard hat jobs or high vis jobs. Uh, the Queensland government had a list of uh, of the strengths of the Queensland economy. Uh, it was agriculture, mining, manufacturing, things which. Uh, certainly people are familiar with, with, but which in Queensland, collectively, those three only employ about 10% of the workforce and primarily a prime age of older male workforce. So when we look at the, uh, when we look at the share of those sectors, they've been declining over a very long period in the middle of the 20th century. Those sectors between them accounted for over half of all workers and most of the remaining workers, uh, retail workers and so forth, are engaged primarily in dealing with the products of the of the primary and secondary sectors. Uh, the economy doesn't look like that now in terms of industries. It also doesn't look like that in terms of occupations. So that um, if you uh, go back to 1986, which is where I could get the data, at that time, 40% of workers were manual workers of the type I've described. That is uh, the kind of workers in those days, of course, high bids vests weren't thought of because we didn't worry about workplace health and safety, but uh, that's a um, advance. Uh, uh, that, but workers doing those kinds of jobs, so, uh, uh, so that's drivers, uh, trades workers, labourers and so forth, uh, made up about 40% of the workforce. Uh, the next group was service workers like uh, uh, retail and clerical workers and the smallest group was professionals and managers. Uh, those have now been reversed. There are more professionals and managers than service workers, more service workers than manual workers. And uh, that's going to continue uh, in the future because of the nature of technological change and nature of, of an information society, uh, we're seeing steady technical progress in all of those, uh, all of those manual occupations, which means that uh, one person can farm more land, one person can produce more, more machines than in the past. All of these things have produced around the world a decline in the share of employment in those sectors. Uh, but politics hasn't really caught up with this and, and in a large measure large measure, I think that's because of a long period of neoliberalism when, when the view was governments should take their hands off and do nothing, let the market work. Uh, when they have to do something, uh, they reach back into the mental store of images from the 1960s or, or 1930s. So they think, roads, what did we do last time? We had a big problem. We decided we'd build a road. That was all male workforce, hired hundreds and hundreds of guys with picks and shovels, and those guys went out and made the road. And so they say, we're going to build a road. And what happens now is they hire uh, an imported machine, uh, a gigantic machine and a few people to operate it and a lot more people to hold signs and do the paperwork around it. Uh, a tiny fraction of the number of the number of jobs created per million dollars spent. And then if they address the actual needs of the crisis, which are in sectors like health, education, uh, public health in particular, a very much neglected area because it's not politically salient, uh, these are the areas where we need 
work. Instead of we're seeing proposals for public sector freezes, uh, actual job cuts in universities, uh, a totally misconceived response uh, to, to the crisis, uh, made even worse by the suggestion that we should bring forward private sector tax cuts, which would create yet more demand for luxury goods like uh, luxury cars and so forth are already booming. We're seeing a misconceived response to the crisis uh, based on the past, when what we should be seeing is a radical reconsideration of the changes that have already taken place and the changes that need to take place in the future. We've had decades, for example, without a reduction in standard working hours. It's very clear now that the economy we have isn't going to be able to deliver full employment on a reliable basis, except with very substantial government underpinning. Some of that should be put into uh, restoring the kind of work-life balance that's been under threat for a very long time. So really, I think, to be fair, uh, the initial response to the, the uh, pandemic, increasing job, job seeker and, and the JobKeeper scheme was a good one, uh, but as soon as the immediate crisis uh, stopped, we've seen just a reversion to the thinking of the past, schemes like Home Builder, when, of course, home building wasn't affected by the, contract, by the in pandemic at all. People kept on building houses. It's true that in due course, we'll need less houses because we'll probably have less population growth. Uh, but the idea that that uh, $150,000 home renovations is, is the kind of thing that needs stimulus in this thing is just crazy. At the same time as, as we undercut uh, childcare services that are, are increasingly vital uh, to get through what appears to be like to be a, a very sustained period of economic emergency. So, um, so I think this is an issue we need to campaign on. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the problems are largely bipartisan. I can't, haven't seen much evidence in this respect that uh, uh, Labor is, is, uh, is uh, any better than the, the Liberals in terms of their political instincts. Uh, I mentioned in our quote wrote recently, we, you know, there's a time when we should be undertaking radical utopian thinking. Instead, we're stuck in an episode of utopia where all the politicians care about is a photo opportunity with a hard hat on. Thanks. I'm uh, a postdoc at the University of Sydney where I work in the Women, Work and Leadership Research Team. I work there with Professor Ray Cooper, who some of you may know um, due to her work on gender and industrial relations. Um, we have been working on a project about women and the future of work. And so when COVID hit and kind of disrupted uh, the future of work, we've been kind of all over the data. So I thought what I would do today is just share a little bit of our early analysis, um, just using some of the um, ABS data uh, to show what the impact of COVID has been on the labor market. That's probably a bit of a review for some of you, um, but then delve a little bit deeper into the effects for women in particular. And then I'll end by talking a little bit about um, gov like where to uh, focus spending at. All right, so as you can see in this slide, um, the labor market has really had a pretty, the COVID really impacted the labor market in a fairly big way. So since March, over three quarters of a million people have lost their jobs. And I'll just point out that over half of those, about 53% have been women. Um, and this is data since the end of May. Uh, the June data hasn't come out yet. Uh, so if we compare that, just to put it in context to a year ago, that means that unemployment is up by almost two points. Uh, so it's at around 7.1% and underemployment, the people who would like to work more hours but are unable to, that's up by about four and a half percent. So it's sitting right around 13.1%. If you look at the chart over on the right, that's the underutilization rates and I've broken it down by age cohort. Um, but right now the underutilization rate, so that's unemployed people and underemployed people as a percent of the labor market. Uh, that rate is about 20% right now compared to 13.8% uh, about a year ago. So it's up as well. But you can see that younger Australians were, have been more vulnerable um, to losing work and losing hours. So that blue line that you see is the 15 to 24 year olds. And then the orange line right below it is 25 to 34 year olds. And each of those, their underutilization rate has increased by about 8% since this time last year. Um, and you see most of that has been in the last two months. And just to give you a sense of how hard uh, young Australians have been hit, um, as many of you know, people have been able to dip into their superannuation funds during this time. And the largest group to do so has been those 
of 25 and 30, with the second largest group being those under 25. And in fact, um, over the past couple of months, over uh, $3 billion Australian dollars have come out of the accounts of those that are under 30. Um, the bottom chart just talks about some of the variation across the labor market. So there's been variation, as you can see here, with some industries like arts and recreation um, and accommodation and food services that have been hit uh, quite a bit harder, as you can imagine, by COVID. Um, I also just want to point out that within industry, there's been a lot of um, a lot of variation as well. So if we think about retail, for example, supermarkets have been booming during this time, while uh, fashion retail has obviously not been doing as well. Um, and I just point that out to, to highlight the fact that the effects of COVID have been quite diverse. So we have some parts of the labor market where people are really working overtime and even getting burned out, uh, while others are looking for jobs and others still are working from home and trying to balance this. Um, so that's kind of the overall picture, but I'm just gonna jump now into the effects for women. Um, let's see. All right, so there, women have had kind of, there are three areas in which women have been affected. The first is that they've really been on the front lines of the COVID response. Um, so they've been working in essential roles in healthcare, early childhood education, and in retail. So if you look over here on the left-hand side, women make up about three-fourths of Australians' health and social care workforce. And just to delve in a little bit to some of the specific occupations, they make up 87% of registered nurse, nurses and midwives and 88% of uh, telehealth workers, which have been particularly relevant in this time of social distancing. Um, they also care for some of Australia's most vulnerable workers. Um, so you can see EC, EC is 96% women, aged care workers are 87% women, and disability support workers are 70% women. Uh, women have also been working uh, in retail uh, particularly if we think about the supermarkets, um, I'm sure as many of you recall, those were pretty frenetic spaces uh, during the height of the pandemic. Um, and women were there. And unfortunately, in talking with uh, the SDA, uh, with some of their members, they recently did a survey. And many of these workers were experiencing customer abuse during that time. Um, so I think 76% said that customer abuse had increased uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. And actually 22% said that they had been deliberately spit on or coughed on uh, during the period, um, which is obviously completely disheartening considering uh, that these workers were out there risking their lives um, for their jobs. And despite their essential status, uh, these jobs, these essential jobs have historically and continue to be underpaid and precarious. So um, on average, they earn less than other industries. And also uh, women, particularly within these industries, tend to be in the lower, more precarious roles um, and more likely to be in casual jobs and less likely to move up into the higher, more secure jobs. Women have also been at the forefront of job loss during this period. So as you can see here on the left-hand side, um, women's employment has dropped by a little over 7% since March, whereas men's has uh, dropped a little less than 6%. And then if we look at hours, women's hours have dropped by about 11%, uh, while men's have dropped by about 9%. Um, so in looking at that, uh, also it's important to note that women have been less, on average, less likely to um, be able to uh, qualify for JobKeeper. Uh, that's in part because they are in casual roles. Uh, and also, as that makes sense kind of logically, um, some of the ABS survey data has also supported women say, women have said more so than men that they've been ineligible for JobKeeper during this time. Young women in particular seem to be particularly feeling the effects of COVID. So in that red bubble there, you can see that two in three women aged 25 to 31 uh, reported financial stress uh, at the end of April, and then a quarter reported feeling very or extremely stressed at that same time. And they're, to be quite frank, they're, their feelings are valid. So um, not only do young women, uh, can they expect to experience gender equality across the labor market, but they also can experience, expect to experience that across their life course, um, with 90% of women entering retirement without sufficient uh, retirement funds. And I mentioned kind of the, the dipping into the superannuation uh, earlier, and women are not more likely than men to be dipping into their superannuation funds right now. But what we do know, at least from some analysis by Alpha Beta, is that uh, women are spending the money differently. So 
women are um, tend to be, while both groups tend to be spending that money to try to pay off debts, women are more likely to be spending it on essential items like clothing and food, whereas men are spending that money uh, more on discretionary items. In particular, uh, gambling has been one of the higher things that men are spending on. Um, and so then the last area where women have been disproportionately affected by is in terms of care work. So prior to the pandemic, women were doing about double the care work or the domestic work of men. Um, and since the pandemic, this is just an early study. And so the, the results are still changing. But as you can see here, um, this is a study from the University of Melbourne and they're doing a survey of hours spent uh, on domestic uh, work. And what you see here is that women are spending about an extra hour each day on housework and four hours each day on childcare. So that's about five extra hours a week uh, compared to about half that among men. Um, so when you look at that over the course of a week, it's about 35 extra hours on top of what they were already doing um, compared to, to be fair, men are doing more as well, but it's only about 18 or so more hours and they were already doing about half what women are doing. So that's an incredible burden that's been kind of happening for women uh, during this time. So then my last point is just to think about kind of um, government, our stimulus spending. And so as, as John mentioned, and as the, the call mentioned, um, a lot of the spending has been focused in, on areas like instruction, but as I've tried to show here, women have been disproportionately hurt by COVID. So that, that spending doesn't actually really attack the bleed. Um, also, I would say that this is a social crisis, not a physical one. And so it's gonna require some investments in the social infrastructure, not the physical infrastructure. Again, kind of echoing what John said earlier. And to that point, um, if we think about the social infrastructure, um, affordable childcare is gonna be really essential area for spending in terms of getting people back to work, getting women back to work, especially. And as we do so, that will really help increase the disposable incomes of family with young children if we can get um, everyone back to work. Uh, also, healthcare and social assistance and education and training, which are feminized industries, are the fastest growing sectors of employment in Australia. So it really does make sense to invest in those areas. And a recent analysis by uh, economists at the University of Sydney found that a 1% investment in care work would generate double the employment returns than a similar investment in construction. Um, so I'll leave it there um, and look forward to some of the discussion. Now, I just want to open the floor up to questions. Has anyone got a question? In, yeah. 1% uh, investment of what? What's the 1% coming out of? One, so 1% investment. Is that for Yes. Oh, yeah. It was of GDP. Sorry about that. <laughs> All good. Um, now, we've got a question from Tim. Yeah, we've got a few questions online. So I might just read one out um, from Tim. Uh, so... This was um, uh, to, I think it was a bit more um, to John, um, but why is the federal government not, oh, no, wrong one. We've got quite a few questions online there. Um, so question for John, is productivity uh, going to be a useful economic measurement of progress in the future, given that it's so hard to capture uh, in the service sector? Uh, John, you might be muted. Yes. Um, so, yes, in my view, uh, productivity has really um, largely ceased to be a useful measure at, uh, at the level of the aggregate economy. Um, uh, there's a bunch of reasons for that. First, of course, uh, uh, it's essentially not measured in the services sector uh, or large parts, but yeah, public sector employment uh, is essentially just treated as... Uh, we're worth whatever we produce. There's no productivity growth and so forth. Uh, and so, we, and uh, this more complicated problem is to do with the fact that we have, on the one hand, uh, incredibly rapid product productivity in information technology, which shows up in Australia in the pro as a reduction in the cost of capital items that we import mostly, uh, combined with fairly stagnant progress in some other parts of the economy. So, so I think the whole kind of structure of the national accounts, GDP and, pro and productivity measures derived from that are really based on the industrial economy I was talking about earlier, which is one where the typical product starts up being grown or dug out of the ground. Uh, the next stage is, is a manufacturing process where it gets turned into a product. 
Uh, then it gets retailed and distributed, and around the edges of it, there's a bit of finance and this sort of stuff, but everything is about material throughput. As that ceases to be the central feature of the economy and as information, which is just not capturable at all in this framework, uh, becomes central, uh, really we have to get past notions like, like GDP. They're still useful in terms of very short-term macroeconomic management. If the Reserve Bank wants to know are things going well or badly, it doesn't really matter whether the measure is comparable or was five or ten years ago. If it's falling right now, that probably means the economy is, is, is not doing well. But in terms of a measure of where we're going and how well off we are, I think it's already ceased to be useful. Um, absolutely. Uh, thanks for that question. We just we have a few others online, so we might just take one of those before uh, throwing back uh, to the crowd here at Unions WA. Um, so this is slightly off topic, but it's still very much on topic. So online searches for family domestic violence help shot up by 75% during COVID lockdown in Australia too. Uh, Perth cops reported a decrease in crime, but um, a 25% increase in domestic violence. Do, so do we see that in any of the figures, Sarah, about the impacts on uh, women or is that uh, not so much in your work at the moment? It wasn't in, in our work here, but it's definitely something that is, is happening. Um, and that I think we're, we're aware of this happening, that there's been an increase in domestic violence for sure. Um, are there any questions from the floor that anyone had? We had a few hands before. I could see a question oh. about the cash economy. Do you, do you want to? Yes, there was a question about the cash economy. Let's throw to that one and then we um, might throw to Henry uh, next. So there was a question about um, the cash economy. Mm. So what is the job for like, what is the consideration for dog walkers, private childcare workers, mm. people making products at home? I know we've seen an increase in people doing side hustles. Mm. Is that consideration as well or anything? Well, like I think, that? yeah. So I think I think there's a general problem with with the rise. I mean, this is a, a, a lot of different things, but with the rise of the gig economy, side hustles, casualisation really peaked during the 1990s, but, but that's been supplemented now by more and more work has been turned into independent contractors. And uh, we saw that that made the operation of, of job seeker and job keeper a lot more difficult. It also meant uh, lots of people under pressure to turn up for work, uh, even when they were sick. And um, so I think one of the things we need to be, uh, one of the things we need to be looking at coming out of the crisis is regularising a lot of the work that's been, has been turned into uh, informal side hustles, casual work, contract and so forth, uh, and um, making, uh, replacing the, both the employer pressure towards turning up, but also the workplace culture of presenteeism in lots of places, uh, you know, quadrille soldier on ads and things like that, to a very clear message that when you're sick, you should stay home and get well, and the least beneficial, the least good thing you can do as a worker is turn up and and make your colleague make yourself and your colleagues ill. So that's part of it. There's a lot more points I think that I could go on about, but um, uh, that those I think are some crucial issues there. Absolutely, and I just want to uh, touch on as well that the ACTU is currently Australian Chance. Australian Council of Trade Unions is currently running a campaign on paid pandemic leave uh, to ensure that uh, all workers in West in Australia have access to paid pandemic leave so that they can stay home. So uh, just a shout out to that campaign. Keep an eye out for it. Jump on the Australian Union's website as well um, because you'll, you'll be able to take some actions um, to, uh, get, yeah, get unions in that space. Um, now I'm just going to get Beck to jump to another question. Try and do one so we've got Henry. Thing, but Henry, so um, try say it out loud and then if not, I'll repeat it back to see how we go. Um, you mentioned issues with using productivity and limitations of GDP as a measure. What would of the economy, what would be a good measure of the economy? I think the question was what would be a good measure of the aggregate economy? I think the answer is we don't actually need a good measure of the aggregate economy. I mean it's it's you know, it was a it was a handy, it was an important thing to have in the context of the industrial economy because uh, you had products going through this cycle of um, 
uh, this cycle of production. And for example, it made a mess of the tax system. So that's why we went to the GST, which taxes the value added at each stage in this process. But as we move to an economy where most services are delivered directly and where there's a huge collective information economy, I think it may just be that uh, we can't get that kind of aggregate measure in a useful way over time. As I've said, as long as the economy is more or less like it is, a GDP type measure will be useful from one year to the next for the for the Reserve Bank or, or fiscal policy to say, I think, yeah, is economic activity rising or falling? But, but really, I think uh, uh, yeah, we really need to be looking at an economy where first, where that industrial model has ceased to be relevant, and second, hopefully where uh, the central focus based on paid work can be replaced with something that gives us uh, more of a balance between um, between uh, paid work in the market and uh, and family and household work, and, and and of course a more equal gender balance in that. Um, so we have uh, another question from uh, online. It might be relevant to the both of you. So. Why is the federal government not supporting or investing in TAFE to retrain underemployed and unemployed uh, people? Uh, especially like we've seen changes here on a state level, but is there more that the federal government can be doing? Um, well, I mean, I've long been an advocate of the federal government taking over, taking over TAFE, uh, scrapping all the existing deals with private providers and integrating TAFE in the university sector uh, in with a guarantee of post-school education for everybody. So um, it's a big deal. Maybe we'll see some action. Uh, as I've said, again, what we see is a, a 1950s type attachment to apprenticeships. You know, people just dig back into what was life like, or see, you know, what was that, what do they mem remember? And it's it's apprenticeships for tradies when most of what we need in vocational education is something quite different from that. In fact, you know, when the schemes are actually introduced, what we see is vast numbers of traineeships are actually for low-paid women's jobs or women-dominated jobs like hairdressing rather than rather than the kind of things that people imagine that they're supporting when, when they do this. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, there's, again, lots more needs to be done. Yeah, I would, I would just echo that and, and just say that I do know we've done some research on, uh, we did a national survey and we found that women... Um, are, are really, that's one of the number one things they want uh, when they think about the future of work is better training and development. Absolutely. So um, we might just take a question from the crowd. There were a few hands before. Um, Sana? Um, as much discussion happened around universal basic income, so like moving job seeker and job keeper into something that's more mainstream that applies to everybody, which then would um, reduce the need for full-time work enable us to have more leisure time, but also then able to meet our basic needs and then work, say, perhaps part-time. Because that's sort of been around for a long time. It, it's not been discussed at the moment. And I think another good measure around GDP rather than productivity and GDP might be employment levels. That might be a good measure of a healthy society. And the lack of homeless, like, yeah. homelessness mm -hmm. and the suicide rate going down and people being able to afford more mortgages. You've got to look at it in social benefits rather than other types of things. That's a great indication of a healthy society. Well, there was lots of discussion yeah. uh, here in person. Uh, what, was John and Sarah, were you able to hear that? I was, yeah. I, I, at least I heard the first part of it, which I've been working uh, uh, working like crazy on participation on various versions of, of universal basic income. Um, if you Google my name and participation income, you'll find, find a lot of stuff. Uh, so... It's a kind of complex and tangled debate, but, but it's certainly, I think, is getting a lot more attention than it did. And I found articles in the conversation essentially precisely saying what the question implied, that JobKeeper ought to be replaced by a participation income or level income guarantee. Sarah, do you have any um, anything else to add on that, maybe about the effects that that might have on, on women and women's work? No, I mean, just to echo some of the things that John has said about um, just kind of reorienting our, our lifestyles away from this kind of myopic focus on paid work um, and trying to expand beyond that, uh, which I think were some of the comments in the room as well. Hmm. I think UBI could play a, a role in that. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Um, are there any other questions from the floor? Yeah, Stephen. Mm -hmm. I just got a minor um, question about some of the data that Sarah was presenting, a bit of clarification. You mentioned that uh, women are obviously being disproportionately hit for unemployment and so they're getting laid off and uh, underemployment so they're getting less hours. Is this because uh, the COVID economic crisis, for want a better word, is disproportionately affected female dominated industries or are we seeing in industries where there's better gender equality or even in male dominated industries, uh, women are getting the short end of the stick there instead. Do you have any clarification on that? Yeah, so uh, we haven't been able to, to delve into that much detail, but what I would say is we just what we know about gender segregation in the labor market, uh, both horizontal gender segregation. So there's feminized industries and, and some of those have been hit. As you saw, some of the industries that were at the top of that list are more feminized industries. Um, so that's definitely a big part of it. But at the same time, women are also, there's vertical segregation. So women uh, make up a lot more of the precarious and lower status jobs, um, which are often the first to go. Um, so it's kind of, I do know that it's a combination of those two things intersecting um, that have really affected women. Uh, but as far as have women in male dominated industries been hit worse, I think was your question. I, that I don't know for sure. I think I should just mention that age has also been a big factor as well as gender. That before before, before the before the pandemic, the increase in underemployment among young people was already a major problem, and and it's just got worse. So uh, uh, yeah, that, that both because the labour market in general has got worse, and because the industries uh, the industries are affected were particularly industries which employed lots of young people who hadn't yet made it into some sense into the core parts of the workforce. Yeah, that, that's a great answer to that question. Uh, Ruth has asked a question online, which is the question that I've been wanting to know the whole time, which are what are some of the specific policies or projects? Um, it says what specific, if not what specific policies do you think policies or projects the federal or state governments have done or they could do to address the gendered impacts of the pandemic, um, even statements to address some of the facts that you've listed there? Um, looking at the Queensland one, I'd say the hard hat photos include a disproportionate number of women wearing hard hats compared <laughs> to reality. That's um, <laughs> uh, that's about uh, that's about as far as uh, far as I've gone in a state with uh, a woman premier and and a, when the program was drawn up, a woman treasurer as well. So it is a very depressing picture, and I think. Um, I think, I mean, the Met, you know, Met is essentially, if you say, do what they did for the first month of the pandemic and reverse everything they've done since, you'd be getting close, that instead of home builder, we should have had a proper addressing of, of childcare, which of course was, was the first thing to be thrown out. Uh, we really haven't seen any consideration of this at the political level, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, the same. I haven't uh, seen anything except for uh, the praise of our heroic uh, women workers, which uh, kind of reinforces this kind of valorization of women's work without supporting it with pay. So uh, that's really all I've seen. Well, with that in mind, though, do you, either of you have any ideas about maybe what our federal and state governments could be doing to help women workers, especially during COVID-19? But I think, I think, as I say, the childcare Childcare and education are, the, are you know, they're the both huge problem sectors, and also, of course, things that are increasing the burden on women at home. As long as we, have, particularly as long as we have school shut down, which is going back and forward, but clearly it's going to be at least at the individual school level going to be a repeated feature of this until the virus is, is overcome. And I suppose, you know, I think, um, but yeah, you know, what we really need is is a more fundamental change in mindset, as well as as well as getting specific policies right, that um, we need to look at, at the fact that when the economy comes out of this, it's going to be radically different to what it was when we went in and, um, and in ways that ways that need to be addressed in a way that's addressed gender balance. That's, I know, a bit woolly, but, but you know, I think that you know, in the short run, you know, the, the policies they've introduced have the, the, the arbitrary exclusions, particularly hit uh, women-dominant areas, first universities, 
I think you know, women have been pretty badly affected by the cuts that have been essentially imposed out of vindictiveness there and now childcare. Yeah, we completely agree with that. I was, I was going to point to childcare as well. Is it's definitely the the number one thing to do? Okay, and um, we have another question here. It just comes from Tonya online. Uh, what can we do to raise the value and income of feminized work and industries? I think one thing. I mean, the Fair Work Act doesn't have an overarching objective of gender equality. And I think getting it built in at an institutional level like that uh, would definitely play a, a large role in trying to, um, that would affect awards um, and, and other things that could really have an impact. So that would be one thing that, that could be done to help try to raise the value and income of feminized work. There's also, I mean, non-market work issues. I mean, the a succession of federal governments have tightened the eligibility for supporting parents' benefits, which uh, uh, this, yeah, which uh, by by reducing uh, reducing the age at which at which parents usually women are thrown off it, um, and uh, you know, the adjustments to the income tax schedules have really I think harmed uh, family tax benefit. Uh, so so valorising the the work of women in in child raising through both through the reversal of those measures and through inclusion in a participation income or level income guarantee. I think would be, yeah, is something that um, uh, is direction we need to go. And again, um, again, sort of trying to move away from a move away from mental model, which is still of the male breadwinner. Um, fantastic. We're gonna we're gonna try something new new here. We're gonna throw to John. I'm gonna unmute you, John, Brooks. and then John Brooks. John Brooks, and then you'll have a chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, let me try there. There you go, think, John. I think I'm unmuted. Yes. Um, yeah. So at first I was going to say, you know, I'm one of these older workers who's keeping younger workers out of the workforce and I don't want to be keeping them out, except I'd be poor if I wasn't working. So <laughs> I'd gladly step aside. Um, but I have a question in relation to what Frank has asked. He's asked about, you know, putting us into debt for generations to come through some sort of generosity or whatever. And... My problem is when the pandemic hit and everything shut down, um, supermarkets kept going, people kept, all the necessities of life were still there and everyone kept buying what they really needed except for toilet paper and pasta and tomat and tomatoes. But um, yet somehow we were racking up huge amounts of debt while this happened. Who were we borrowing the money from? Uh, you know, who was foregoing expenditures so that we could live so that we could still go to the supermarket. How does that work? Uh, sure. So um, it's a complicated story. But first thing is, I mean, I don't think we should think of it as older workers keeping young workers out of work. Rather, uh, I'm merely making the point that older workers in this particular crisis have got off relatively lightly. Uh, that wasn't true, for example, in the 1990s. So programs which effectively primarily are directed at, what well, really prime age, 25 to 54 male workers are just, just pointed in the wrong direction. Looking at what's happened, in the short run what's happened is that people who've kept, been, people who've kept their jobs haven't been able to go to, uh, certainly not overseas, unless they live in Queensland, they haven't been able to go to Noosa, uh, they haven't been able uh, uh, for, during the lockdown to go to restaurants and even now they're not doing as much of it. Uh, and so that's where essentially where, where the reason that We've been able to give an up and able to give the resources to unemployed people, or people who, that is people who aren't who aren't providing those services uh, to go and buy things. Globally, everybody is doing pretty much the same thing. So my guess is globally, globally, obviously, we all owe the money by ourselves. If we had a world government, that would be the answer. Uh, it's uh, yeah. in a country like Australia, we have historically been the net foreign borrower. But my impression is. The debt we're running up is a debt we collectively owe to ourselves. That debt, as things stand, is primarily held by upper income earners. They're the people who have plenty of money and really have been unable to spend it, except on a few, you know, people have been buying luxury cars like crazy because that's something they can still buy. But in general, money's been piling up in the bank accounts, particularly of high income earners who are still employed. Uh, what we need in the end to do is is have a long period of negative real interest rates like we did after World War II, which effectively means bondholders 
in real terms, get back less than they put in because by definition, in some sense, if you come out of this with a big holding of bonds, you didn't suffer very much during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's the way we have that's the way we have to do things. Um, and we should be essentially trying to aim for. I mean, I'm now coming back, and GDP is a kind of a, an unavoidable measure here. Yeah, you know, if we aim for seven percent growth in nominal GDP every year, in ten years' time, any debt fixed in money terms would be half what it was as a share of GDP, and and that's essentially how we paid off the debt after World War Two. Yeah, you know, there wasn't. There wasn't after World War II any long period when everybody was suffering, saying, you know, who's going to pay for all these bombs that we dropped and, and guns that we made in the war? Uh, it was the most prosperous time, you know, modulo the male-dominated employment structure and stuff, but essentially a time of great prosperity and the debt was just gradually eroded away. Uh, we might see if there are any other questions from the floor here at Union WA. There we go. Got one. <laughs> yeah. Just a um, question. You managed to double the job seeker um, payments, lift people from a real horrible, sorry, not job seeker, yeah, job seeker. Job seeker. People yeah. make really horrible, um, unaffordable poverty that we make people have to go through. And we remove the obligation, well, we should, it's supposed to remove the obligation to go seek try and find all these jobs when there aren't jobs. Have there been any positive, like measurable positive benefits from that that we've been able to see? Well, I think the what we've seen is an absence of the kind of disasters that have happened uh, yeah, in where, where we haven't seen that extension. I mean, in many poor countries, of course, but also I mean, the US has, in fact, in most places everywhere, has, in, has given some increase, even the US. Uh, but, but theirs, of course, is haphazard because of the state-level employment system they have. So we've seen lots more suffering there. I mean, essentially, considering you know, that roughly 3 million people are in some sense out of work, it's the absence of massive suffering that's, that, is, that is the evidence. Uh, looking ahead, just, just to jump in, yeah, with the, the part of the idea of a livable income guarantee would be that when we get a little bit ahead of this, uh, we should restore the parity between JobKeeper and, and, and the age pension, which we had until the 1990s. That would be a cut compared to the existing level, but a big increase compared to what prevailed uh, before the crisis. And that would be a central part of a livable income guarantee. Uh, thanks for that, John. Um, I also just want to give another shout out to another campaign called Raise the Rate, uh, which is run by the Australian Council of Social Services. Um, if you jump on that, yesterday was their National Day of Action and unions uh, um, have been teaming up with ACOS on this uh, and that is about ensuring that uh, the job keeper, sorry, job seeker payments are, of, uh, yeah, uh, stay up, stay high permanently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so let's jump to, I think we can probably take one more question. Whether it, yeah, whether it's online, in person. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of go for it, Rod. A uh, question for Sarah, I think. Um, the, I, I happen to work for a, uh, a State Department and 75% uh, of our workforce is female. And what I think that really, maybe not so much enjoyed, but appreciated is that uh, they have been working from home quite a few of our staff uh, because of family responsibilities mainly. But um, certainly, uh, Sarah, are, are you planning any uh, research around um, uh, long-term long working from home? Particularly, I, I would think there'd be additional costs uh, to the individual. I know they can, you can claim 80 cents, I think, an hour on your tax if you're working from home, but uh, there's obviously the cost of uh, you know, providing a, a, perhaps a study, internet, uh, internet access, a modem, things like that, and, uh, and, and the effects that would have long, if it was to become uh, entrenched longer term. Yeah, great question. Um, so we are we are doing a study with the Law Society, uh, which is a particularly uh, unique profession, obviously. But they this you know has been kind of this 
a worldwide experiment in flexible working and it's had some benefits in that obviously um, flexible work is something that uh, many feminist uh, scholars have been arguing for for quite a long time because of the benefits of managing work and family. Uh, but it does have, especially in a neoliberal context in which we've kind of been operating in, um, the costs do seem to be going down to the individual. So paying for um, the, the internet and the office space. And also uh, what we found with that group in particular so far in just our early discussions, we haven't done uh, the systemic research yet, um, but a lot of people are working longer hours. So companies are really getting a benefit um, in terms of people are working longer hours, they're paying part of that cost. Um, and actually um, what we were asked by some, some firms was, you know, what's the business case? To give us the business case for this. And, and I'm actually shocked that that's still a question at this time um, because really it's, it's in everyone's benefit for people to be agile and flexible at this point in time, especially as we kind of go back and forth between lockdown and not. Um, so it's a great question. It's something we look forward to studying, um, hopefully with a wider population than just one profession. Uh, but those are kind of some of the early discussions that we've been having. Oh, fantastic. Thanks for that. Do we have uh, time for one more question? Or? Yeah, yeah, let's take another one. Okay. One more. Okay, one more. <laughs> if they're around. If anyone's got one. Maybe this is not. your chance. <laughs> Uh, I'll just have a look in the chat. Have we got, no? Okay, well, maybe we'll wrap things up then in that case. Um, thank you, uh, Sarah and John for joining us tonight. I know it's 8 p.m. where you, well, it's probably closer to 9 p.m. now where no, you no. both are. Um, so thank you. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, uh, and well done to everyone for your input and uh, questions um, in our third economics for unionists.